This podcast represents the opinions of our hosts and their guests only. The content here should not be taken as medical advice and is for informational purposes only. And because each person is so unique, please consult your healthcare professional for any medical questions. Welcome to Once Shattered, Picking Up the Pieces, a podcast devoted to changing the way eating disorders and mental illness are viewed in our society. With your hosts, Jack and Linda Major and Ellen Bennett. Today's guest is Kim Paikonka. As a lived experienced professional, Kim is passionate to provide siblings who have a brother or sister with an eating disorder the acknowledgement, connection, and resources they have never been afforded. To highlight this need, she has collaborated alongside clinicians, researchers, and organizations for over a decade. In 2018, she co-created a sibling needs survey with Bridget Whitlow, LMFT, that has reached over 500 siblings around the world. The survey has continued to bring the sibling experience to light. That same year, KimAdvocates.com was created to allow a space for siblings to share their experiences, stories, and perspectives. Along with these incredible interviews, Kim has had the privilege to educate and support hundreds of siblings and parents, which has led to the Sibling Support Series. Based on the series feedback, she is developing a course for parents and siblings. Stay tuned. Kim currently serves as a community advisor for Equip and co-chair for the Academy for Eating Disorders Expert by Experience Committee. The links for today's show and for our hosts will be in the show notes. Welcome, everyone. So glad you could join us today. Kim will be with us in just a moment. But in the meantime, I'd like to introduce my co-host, my soulmate and my best friend, Jack Major. Hello, Linda. Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us today. And this the one, is, oh, go ahead, oh, sorry. This is going to be a fabulous, fabulous interview. Absolutely. And I'd also like to introduce our dear friend and fellow eating disorder and mental health advocate, Ms. Ellen Bennett. Hello. Again, so excited. We're going to have a great conversation. Very important conversation for sure. So I always like to start for a, with a quote, and my quote for this episode is, a child whose behavior pushes you away is a child who needs connection more than anything else. And that is a quote by Kelly Bartlett. What do you guys think? Yeah, I think it's a, a child who pushes you away is, is a child that's, that's asking for help. I think they, but they don't know. Maybe they don't know how, but I think they're, they just need help. Um, and can't put it into words. Can't put it into words. Yeah. True, 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 true. That everybody should have that quote in their mind all the time. Um, it's powerful and it's so real. Having worked in education for over 25 years, I, that is, I'm, I'm touched by that very, very much. Well, thanks for liking the quote that I just read and somebody else came up with, but thank you, I agree. So you've heard Kim's bio, and now she's joining us all the way from sunny California via Zoom. We are thrilled to welcome you, Kim. Thank you so much. It's such a pleasure to be with the three of you. I think we're going to have a wonderful conversation. And I love the quote, too. Absolutely, that will come into play today, for sure. Kim, welcome, welcome, welcome. I am so fortunate to be able to say this is one of my friends and colleagues. And I met Kim about seven years ago at a conference with my daughter, Megan. And needless to say more than it was an instant connection. And we have maintain contact over the years, and we are the co-chairs for the Academy for Eating Disorders Experts by Experience Committee. So welcome. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. It's, again, it's such a pleasure. And Ellen and I, yes, we've been down the road, and uh, you were one of my first contacts for sure. And uh, I think I sat in the back of that conference crying quite a bit uh, because I had never heard anybody else talk about anything, anything about eating disorders. Maybe that was a little bit later. We met, I think we met a little bit 
longer ago. I hate to tell you that. <laughs> was it eight years? It could be eight. I couldn't quite. Um, but Megan and I were really, really new to having lost our Katie. And I can remember kind of bumping into you at, at near a table. I can I have a clear picture of it and kind of saying, Oh, and what brings you here? And and you know, I said, Well, we, you know, lost my daughter Katie, and you said I lost my sister, and Megan said, Oh my God, you lost your sister. And that energy of that shared experience was powerful and it it's remains so forever and will always be. Absolutely. Really precious moments for me to meet siblings like that. And when I talk to siblings or work with them, <clears throat> it's always the same. Pardon me. It's always the same. Just this breath of, oh, my gosh, there's someone else that gets it. <laughs> Somebody else that understands uh, and there's no there's no explanation needed, no no excuses, no it's just yeah, I just hear them, they hear me, and we understand each other. So this first question is a, <clears throat> about about your sister. And you know your sister struggled with an eating disorder, uh-huh. and I understand you and your sister were very close growing up. So can you share more about your family and your relationship with your sister before she developed the eating disorder? Yeah, um, my parents are Ron and Jeannie, and they are now uh, married almost, I was thinking about this, I think over 60 years. So we've been, uh, yeah, so there's been, they're, they're fabulous people. And I have an older brother who's eight years older than myself. And my sister, Casey, was two years younger than me, roughly, a little bit less. Uh, and yes, Casey and I were inseparable when we were little. I was thinking about it. It was a lovely way to think about her uh, recently. We, she was my very first memory, bringing her home. We were both adopted. And I remember the day we brought her home. And uh, my brother, Tom, was um, definitely the guy who taught me to swim, to ski. He was, I, if, my, if my brother did it, I did it. He was just everything to me. I, I adored him. And so when we brought Casey home, she was going to be that for me. I was so excited to be a big sister and um, she was darling and I loved her. And I was a preemie, so she's bigger than me. <laughs> so <laughs> my, I wanted to hold her a lot, but I couldn't. And I was frustrated that I couldn't t- carry her around and take care of her. And just, I adored her and we had a lot of fun. We were best buddies for sure. We we're very different people. My sister was into um, what I call girly stuff, you know, dressing up and makeup. And I was definitely putting my Barbies out into safari and <laughs> let's go out and have an adventure. <laughs> We're totally different people. Uh, but we got along and complimented one another quite a bit. Um, and that was, I think, the hardest part for me in the beginning, well, through the whole experience of her eating disorder was just missing that connection, missing her and uh, when the eating disorder took her over, I was the first one that noticed it because I, she was missing. I didn't mm-hmm. recognize the person I was looking at and I saw it occur over, you know, over time, but I was so little that I did not have the language to express what exactly I was witnessing. No depth or breadth of experience to, to pull from. And of course, never saw anything like um, it wasn't really her behaviors yet. I knew what bulimia was, but those weren't, that wasn't what I saw. It was her, her person that changed. It was her personality. It was her, our connection, her aggression, like this anger that started building up and a deep, deep sadness. And so I would say to my mom, I think Casey's sad. That's all I knew what to say. I think Casey's sad. And of course she'd look over at her and my sister would be laughing or playing and she'd say, no, she's all right. She's okay, honey. Wait, it's all right. Don't worry about it. And I knew in my gut, uh, this isn't right. And so that's how that began. But yes, she was absolutely darling. And of course, a lovely person. She was a troublemaker too, though. Let's not get that. <laughs> Let's get that <laughs> my sister was a troublemaker and we absolutely fought. Um, I have sisters and brothers ask me, is it okay that we fight? 
is it okay that we don't always get along? And, you know, I want to put it out there. Absolutely. That's incredibly normal. And uh, there's nothing wrong with what you're doing. Of course, you're going to get angry at them here and there. Mm -hmm. Uh, Siblings are powerful relationships. Um, Can you expand a little bit as as the years kind of progressed and you saw behaviors change and you were concerned and it was hard to get other people to say, to understand that this is scary, something's not right. One of the things that was challenging, pardon me, one of the things that was challenging for, for my storyline was that my sister, a lot of times you'll hear storylines with anorexia and the weight comes off and that's what people notice. My sister was in a bigger body and my sister was bulimic. So her personality shifted. There was aggression. There was anger. She was unhappy with how she looked. She, she went through puberty and it got worse. Um, and there wasn't really one thing that I could say stuck out. It was really her temperament that changed. And I shared a room with her. So in a bathroom with her, I knew, you know, I was with her. I saw her all the time and I was concerned about the shift in her. Looking back, it's very evident. My sister had binge eating disorder quite young, but of course that doesn't, garner attention because it's not dramatic. It's not a scary um, weight loss or something of that nature. Um, And she would use techniques to normalize it. For example, cooking for me and making meals and doing things around food. And for a while it was cute. And then it became odd. And there was something, there was an energy behind it that I picked up on and I was uncomfortable with it. And then when she got into high school, uh, and she spoke very clearly. Someone taught her how to be become bulimic. Um, there was a big shift. How to sorry? How to purge? There was a big shift in her. Um, and ooh, we began to fight because I was like, "What are you doing? This didn't make any sense to me." She became. My sister was not a quiet person. She was she was gregarious and the life of the party. Um, she gained a lot of weight. She was, a, she was much taller than me and, uh, a force to be reckoned with bright, all of that troublemaker for sure that that personality trait stayed into play. So for the outside world, she was just sort of a rebellious teenager, young preteen teenager. But to me, I kept insisting there's a big problem here. There's a big problem here and I'm getting nervous. And uh, as time went on, I knew she was bulimic. I could name that. It wasn't even diagnosable at the time, but I could name that she was bulimic. I knew exactly what that was. And I knew that she was becoming an alcoholic and she was an incredible manipulator to lie to adults about it. So it was my word against her word. And people believed me. It wasn't that they didn't take my concerns, but they, this is just teenage years. This is just who she is. Um, Don't worry about it. It'll be fine. And year after year, I sank further into depression because it it wasn't fine and it wasn't normal. Uh, And because she was in a bigger body, years went by before we got attention. Uh, It wasn't until she went to college and, People gave her tips and tools to uh, lose the weight, and she ended up in the hospital at a very low weight and almost died uh, within three months. So that was the first time people said, hmm, she might have a problem. (laughs) I was enraged because I had for five years been screaming, she has a problem. There's something very wrong going on here. Let's discuss this. She's bulimic. She's got a drug problem, uh, pardon me, an alcohol problem. Um, There is, this is serious. School system, my parents just didn't buy into that, didn't believe it. Clinicians too? Were there doctors that were saying, don't worry about that? No doctor said anything to her. Nothing came up that way. Lose weight is what they were told her. (laughs) So what what decade was this that? This was in, well... It got serious, I would say, in 1980, in the 80s, in the mm-hmm. 80s. Okay. Mm-hmm. I hope we're doing a little bit better now, but we still have so far to go. So far Bigger to go. bodies, I would say, no, we are not. 
Yeah. And that's so sad. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, in 2018, you created a sibling, um, you co-created a sibling needs survey with Bridget Whitlow, which has reached over 500 siblings around the world. This survey brings the sibling experience to light. Can you share some of the things you learned from this sibling needs survey? Absolutely. The reason we ended up doing this, by the way, was because through the whole experience, my sister was uh, quite ill for over 15 years. And in that time, there were so many I became, you know, in the quote, we talk about a child that I was a good child. I became the perfect child, wanted my parents to be okay. I wanted my life to not be distressing for them. I didn't do anything outside of the scope of being a good kid. Um, And I was incredibly codependent, clinically depressed, very uh, anxious, and I hid it all. I didn't tell anybody that was going on um, because I didn't want to be a burden. And in through the process of going to conferences that went after my sister passed, I was 32 when she passed. So my entire childhood was around an eating disorder and I wasn't sure what I had experienced was I thought we were this weird family that went through this thing and we failed her and we were wrong. And we sat in a ton of shame, a ton of stigma, and it silenced us completely. Didn't talk. We didn't talk to people about it. We didn't talk to anybody about it. There was just, we broke entirely. Uh, Talk about one shattered picking up the pieces entirely our story. So when it came time to me, when I went to conferences and heard other stories, I thought, well, maybe I'm, maybe I'm not that different. Maybe this was real. It took a long time for that to come up. And even I got, people kept asking me, would you please work with siblings? Would you please work with siblings? And I was very uncomfortable. I wasn't allowed to talk about my experience. I wasn't allowed to discuss this. So I was nervous. And I said to Bridget, I'm not sure my storyline is accurate. I think I'm really extreme. I think this isn't normal. And she said, all right, what do you want to do? And we discussed back and forth and decided to do this survey to hear directly from a sibling, from that voice. And I promise you, I thought we'd get five people. I didn't think this would go anywhere. We put it together, put it out, gave it to different uh, organizations that we knew. And lo and behold, the data started pouring in. And it was profound in my own life to hear siblings around the world of all ages, of all experiences, all genders talking about exactly what I went through. It didn't matter if they were anorexic or binge eating disorder, bulimic. It didn't matter if it was short or long-term, severe and enduring. There was definite themes that emerged and they were uh, significant, significant we kept it up for quite a while because siblings said, we are so thrilled that somebody's asked us. You're it. You're the only people that have ever asked us. And of course, the 50, 60 and 70 year olds that answered broke my heart because they said no one ever thought to see how we were doing through this process. So um, the themes that really emerged were siblings definitely wanted to be acknowledged This is something that impacts us too. We are part of the family. If you say family, mean family. Include us in the discussion. Um, Acknowledge that this is hard, that we have our own issues, that we don't experience it like parents. Please acknowledge that um, we might have things going on in our own lives, that we miss you. Painful, you know, very, very heartbreaking comments. And it was very evident that siblings loved their sister and brother, loved their parents and wanted to be there, but they needed support. They needed their own support. They wanted education. Education was another big one. Please tell us what's going on. What is an eating disorder? What is this going on? Uh, If there's co-occurring issues, please don't ignore them. Don't don't leave me out of the conversation. Um, So education, communication, support and acknowledgement. 
that was those were the real big ones that came out and over time i i received many many i've talked to hundreds of siblings and parents over over the years and um another one that really i think it culminates down to kids especially if it happens younger kids don't have language to explain what happened and they don't have emotional language to say i'm fe- this is very difficult mom and dad <laughs> they don't know how to express their emotions they don't they're afraid of their feelings um and it can be very frightening for them because they're not able to access they can't express themselves and it can get that can become a problem in and of itself uh, because there's guilt over anger for example so you said people in their 50s and 60s were part of the survey how um, what was the youngest age group nine nine Mm-hmm. And it was anonymous and we had no way of contacting them at all. So it was a non, a totally anonymous. Uh, so it was nine to 70 years of age and everything in between. Well, thank you for doing that because these people just wanted to be recognized and you know, understood that they were um, suffering too and suffering in silence. And the wonderful thing about that, it it really highlighted research that has been done. There's very little research that's been done on siblings and the impact on them. What's been done is do siblings help in in recovery or not? And most of that was people in hospitals, uh, mostly uh, siblings of an anorexic uh, female, a lot of cisgender, a lot of the stereotypes, right? Mm-hmm. So we wanted to include every voice, but it really, the same things are coming out if the, on the studies of impact. And I, I connect with, um, I've connected with Don Meyer, who is the sibling expert for disabilities and the, their research shows the very same thing. These are not, you know, this is kind of common sense in, in many respects. Right. Uh, it's just highlighting it to show the need. Right. There's something so healing about finding a village of support or a community of support that you can talk about those things with and you don't have to worry about boring somebody or having somebody roll their eyes, you know, just need people who get it. I think it's wonderful that you've done this. Absolutely. Thank you. And I just want to highlight for those who have lost somebody and twins, I want to highlight these two populations real quick. First of all, siblings are not just young kids. They grow up and they're severe and enduring and you go through weddings. I get calls about, oh my gosh, my wedding's coming up. What's going to happen? I'm so afraid. (laughs) Weddings and, and having kids and getting, you know, your life, big life moments happen and you're still coping with somebody who might have an eating disorder. And as, as we never in the eating disorder field talk about the sibling who is now uh, 40, 50 and taking care of maybe an adult sibling who has children. So they are the aunt who has, or the uncle who has to care for the children as well as their sick sibling and possibly their parents. So they are sandwiched and in, and need so much support but don't even have a voice yet. They don't even have, it's not even acknowledged that they may even be going through something. Twins suffer quite a bit, uh, especially with language, for example. Um, and people just, I, I think we just don't think about this, right? I remember my first twin contacting me and saying, hysterical, like unable to breathe practically, saying, my sister is so sick and they keep saying it's genetic. When am I going to get sick? language being so critical in what we're telling younger kids, um, thinking that's such a great, oh, it's a genetic illness. And we're all so thrilled about that. But if you are 14 hearing that and you're the twin of somebody, that's a terrifying statement. So being very cautious about the language we use, siblings are not adult parents, you know, they're not coming from the same perspective. Uh, and then those who've lost a sibling, um, so much grief happens prior to the death. Mm-hmm. I missed my sister. I would just, my, I, I lived in anger because I couldn't tolerate, I now know, I couldn't tolerate the grief, right? I just could not tolerate this, the grief I felt on a daily basis. So I missed her for 15 years. And then when she died, I lost hope. And that was really the grief when she actually passed. It was like, oh, I'll never... It's over. 
in one set, I fought for 15, I, what? I had no words to express what having it end so sharply meant. No support groups, nobody in the field that did anything on that. There was no place to go. I felt, I just fell apart. I mean, PTSD and trauma, that was massive trauma um, in the making, I think for a long time, but absolutely people um, are traumatized by these events and there really isn't enough in our field um, to help people in these, in these really painful and um, devastating times. How was your brother, Tom? How did he do it? You know, interestingly, we fit right into siblings are different people. <laughs> he was eight years older than me, 10 mm -hmm. than my sister. So he was out of the house when a lot of the things went down. He didn't see her behaviors. He was living in a different state. And so we have very, very different experiences going through this. Uh, I think also our gender roles played mm -hmm. into that as well. He was very black and white about it. Like, let's get her help. This is not our fault. And he, he could compartmentalize it mm -hmm. well. I felt enmeshed. I, I felt like it was my responsibility because no one was seeing it. So I became her little parent, it was totally enmeshed, totally over the top codependent. Uh, it was, in, it's, I feel for myself at that time, I thought I was so mature <laughs> at the 14. I was like, mom and dad, this is what we're going to do. Um, yeah, yeah. I was taking over. I was really um, felt responsible for whether she lived or died. And that took quite a bit for me to unravel after, after she passed. You grew up fast. Mm -hmm. yeah. So because of all that, in the same year of 2018, CamAdvocates.com was created to allow a safe space for siblings to share their experiences, their stories, and their perspectives that someplace they never didn't have before. So you may have already shared some of it, but can you share more with us and also tell us about Sibling Support Series? Let me just say one thing. Kim Advocates is K-Y-M. <laughs> right? Yes. Yeah, my first is the <laughs> we want people to be able to find you. Sorry for interrupting. Go ahead. No, that's okay. <laughs> uh, yes. So I started that just to even have the words out there. So if someone looked up, this is what I searched, you know, in my, when I could get drive, I had a ritual that I'd go every week to the bookstore. <laughs> Internet didn't exist yet. And look for something that said sibling or bulimia, anything. I, I would cross my fingers. I could tell you the, what the bookshelves look like in color. I knew every book on the shelf and I never found it, never. So when I started this website, all I really wanted was people to be able to find something and said, yes, your experience is real. And two, if you wanna share your experience, let's share with each other so that we don't feel alone and every voice matters. You know, if you found great, you you found recovery with your sister or brother if it went really well i want to hear that if it didn't go well i want to hear that anything you have to say it there's no judgment here and i deeply needed that i deeply wanted to do that what i learned very quickly is that siblings are not allowed to share that information there's this rule of it's not your story to tell and siblings would contact me and say i want to do this but I can't be, I can't do a video. I can't use my real name. I don't know if I should do this. And they got nervous. So what happened was that only siblings who had lost somebody would be willing to talk yeah. or they had a very, very good relationship with their sister or brother and got permission. So it became challenging to get those voices out there. And I'm working on that a bit uh, because I think we all shared the storyline. It's all, we're impacted entirely as a family independently and there's no shame in telling the story. There's no, there shouldn't be stigma. We're helping each other with these stories. It's never been about making the person with the eating disorder feel bad or making parents feel guilty. It's always been about providing siblings just that, uh, I, in my mind, I sort of think of a big hug that they need mm -hmm. to go, this matters too. Your voice matters too. This impact matters to you as well. So that's when we did the survey because I was like, well, maybe I'm wrong. Maybe people don't want to hear this, but they absolutely do. 
And one of the biggest things they asked for was just to talk to siblings. They wanted, you know, there's a, there's this guilt that comes. If you talk to a parent, you sort of censor yourself because you never want them to feel bad. And so they want to talk to siblings so that you can, they can just vent it out and say what they need to say without worrying about hurting someone in their family. And, um, that's how the groups, that's how I started the groups. Um, and I know how deeply scary that can be to come forward. And it really showed in the sibling series. Siblings signed up. They were excited. I got people going and then people wouldn't show up. I'm too afraid. This is too scary. I don't know if I should say anything. So that's, I, I'm working with the sibling population to help them move forward and feel free to, um, tell their story and know that their story is important and they matter just as much as everybody else. It's okay. It's okay to, to share your, your hurt and your pain and your um, needs. It's a big deal though. Yeah. So I'm, I'm constantly developing. And I think the best way is to get uh, people involved through courses and anonymous at first so that they start learning about what is the sibling experience. Do other people share the same feelings I have? What are my feelings? <laughs> how do I tell my story? I'm not even sure I know how. Um, is it okay to be angry? That's a big one. Um, and um, I feel guilty for feeling angry. You know, the anger is a big, uh, a big sticky point for siblings. So just giving permission. It's allowed, you're allowed to feel anything you want to feel. You're not a bad person. It's okay to be angry. It's okay to feel scared and hurt and sad. And let's talk about what those feelings are. It's and complicated, I'm, very yeah. complex. And I'm sure many of them um, worried about their parents. I mean, they were certainly worried about the, the person suffering with the eating disorder, but what it was doing to the parents and their relationship. And I know Matthew was so worried about us when we were going through everything with Emily and, um, you know, he loved us. He loved Emily, but he got angry, you know, at, uh, yeah. what was happening and what it's was, complicated. yeah. Very I mean, complicated for everyone. Absolutely. It's, and that is common, by the way, that whole protection of your parents. That's why I became good. You know, this, this good child so that my parents didn't have anything for me to, I felt like I always say the foundation was cracking in our family and I didn't want it to break. Yeah. So I just was terrified. My parents would fall apart. If I said, I'm feeling angry about this, <laughs> you know, I was so worried about them. Absolutely. Um, so one of the things you can definitely do is say, I'm going to be okay. You'll see me cry. You'll see me get angry. You'll see me have feelings. And those are normal because you're modeling you're modeling for them. It's okay. It's such an important conversation to have. I know one of the gifts that you gave me was just acknowledging that that sibling experience is, is really important. And it definitely changed how I um, communicated with Megan and really said, hey, Meg, you know, I realized that you you had a really tough path for a multitude of reasons based on all the complexities. And I do remember her saying something following Katie's death. And she said, Mom, no one ever asks how I'm doing. Powerful powerful statement to really be, oh, and it was true. It was true. And she didn't have, fortunately, she had some really, excuse me, um, friends that really good friends that were there for her and, and rode the journey with her and are still there. And, and she's developed that voice, but I, I, it's just so important. What else are you thinking of doing next? Um, with now that you've kind of you've got some data, you've started the support series. What are you thinking? Where are you headed? Well, you know, just in this conversation right now, my heart breaks because I'm talking to three parents <laughs> who have <laughs> lost a child. Right, so I am stirring the pot as we speak, and it. Uh, one of the things that's really dear 
to my heart is making sure that I know what it's like to feel left out. And I don't want anybody, I don't think we should be healing in silos. I think the whole family needs to work together and it's never, ever too late to repair that. I didn't speak to my parents for a year after my sister died. I was furious with them. Um, But then we worked together and we came back together. It's okay that your family, you know, this is a disease that is complicated and it is, it takes a long time and it's heartbreaking. We don't have access. We don't have, we don't have, we don't have a lot in eating disorder treatment. So it isn't unusual to, to think families are going to crack and, and have trouble. So shame and stigma and secrecy and uh, lack of bringing relationships back together is very important to me. And it's also really important that I I am well aware that the people who are in treatment get much better sibling support than those who don't. So my heart's really with the people who just can't find support. They just can't find the treatment. There's so many cultures that don't recognize mental health. There's so many, you know, I mean, we could go through, I am a a cis white privileged person that my parents had money to try to get my sister help, Uh, you know, and, we, and she's dead. I mean, it, it didn't work out. So everything, everybody else that's in any type of struggle, single parents, uh, different cultures that don't deal with mental health. Oh, my gosh, the struggle is enormous. So access to I want to provide courses for for parents as well as siblings so they can talk to each other and know what the other experience, what they're learning and what they're experiencing and just bring the families together and work together for healing. Um, There's so much beautiful opportunity in that. And we'll see how it goes. This is all I'm it. (laughs) I'm really kind of, there's groups out there, but I'm forging this path. uh, um, And it's hard. I, you know, I'm, I'm trying to reach siblings where they, where they, where I can meet them. I'm trying to meet them where they are and where parents are as well. So it's a little bit challenging, but we'll get there. We'll find what works and what really reaches out and, and resonates with them. So they're not, I'm not giving up at all. Not even close. Well, I think the floodgates are going to open. So I just be prepared. (laughs) Um, Kim, you currently serve as a community advisor for equip and co-chair for the Academy for Eating Disorders Expert by Experience Committee. Can you please tell our listeners about the title at Experts by Experience and your role in both of these organizations and also what you see for the future? I'm thrilled to be working with both these organizations. I've had the privilege of, of being part of a lot of the big the big nonprofits and so on and so forth. So forth. And it, everybody's working very hard to meet the needs. And so Equip came around and um, they're they're new on the block, but doing outstanding work, thinking outside the box and doing virtual care, making sure everyone's involved, getting mentors involved. Um, it's, It's thrilling to watch them grow and evolve and become very successful. And so it's an honor for me to serve as the sibling you know, a sibling voice there. And um, AED, Accounting for Eating Disorders, Ellen and I co-chair the Expert by Experience Committee right now. And that's been exciting because it's evolving into once, you know, for a long time, the Expert by Experience voice was, we are knowledgeable because we've been there. We know because we've been in those shoes. But now we're taking that a little bit more and going, how do we partner with professionals so that story and data come together to really help the world, our societies understand what an eating disorder is and the needs. And we're, I think you're referring expert by experience. We have looked into the words of lived experience professional, because for those of us like ourselves sitting here, we're taking that expert expertise just a bit further and removing it from our own storyline and helping, for example, my story, if it enhances help for siblings, that's one thing, you know, that's great, but I'm really looking to help the sibling voice and get siblings up and running. I'd love to, to bring siblings more into my work and, and, and create a professional role for them. So it's just a little bit different expert by experience 
can support each other, be there for each other. It's a, it's just language. It's just taking the, the, it one step up a little further ahead. I hope some of the um, things you're um, working with, the surveys and KimAdvocates.com and, and the experts by ex- experience disseminates down all those stories and all those things disseminate down to the insurance industry too, because they need to understand that, you know, I mean, these, these stories and these families, and again, you know, every 52 minutes, somebody's dying from the effects of an eating disorder and they need to understand um, what that effect has on, on families. I mean, you know, they have such compassion for, and rightfully so for, you know, everybody with cancer and, and other you know, terrible diseases, but it's just like this is the the silent disease out there. Uh, Cindy Bullock calls it the the redheaded stepchild. The redheaded stepchild. <laughs> <you know? laughs> so um, you know uh, oh, what you're yeah, doing so is wonderful, and and um, we just need more more of those things. I know in in being involved now in the eating disorder community, I see there's so many things out there and I know equip is being covered by a lot of other things are covered now by some of the insurance, the major insurance companies. And that's a, that's a huge step. So a big step. That's an important piece. Yes, absolutely. Because both, I think all three of us relate on the insurance thing. My sister didn't get diagnosed because of BMI and she died because of BMI Mm -hmm. due to insurance. It's, you know, her, her BMI was fine when she died. <laughs> Her organs were in full failure and they said she was healthy enough to leave uh, yeah. treatment center. So I called them. This is one of my not proud moments, but this is, speaks to the desperation and the infuriation of having to deal with ignorance on that level. Um, I called the insurance guy up and I said, oh, she's dead. Does she qualify now? Does she qualify now? He wasn't pleased with me, but I I know, right? I was so infuriated that three months earlier, we couldn't, even though her entire body was shutting down, she didn't qualify. It's ridiculous. Well, and I, and it's, I, it's and I wish that everybody who's affected by that and, and has that failure you know, I know we're not going to save everyone. Okay, I know that. But right. we should be but trying. We should be trying. But I know mm-hmm. that when there's that failure by the insurance industry to recognize that, that every family should call the insurance company and say, oh, my child's dead now. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. They, yeah. They, and and we, we need to put faces in, in, on those, those, those people, those, sto- those deaths and the stories about those deaths and Mm-hmm. Right. I, know, this, this, I know the people that I've talked to since, you know, we wrote the book and this, this podcast and everything are just astounded by the statistics that I tell them about, you know, eating disorders and, and the deaths and, and the lack of coverage. It's, they just. Well, people, even insurance companies don't realize that and don't pay as much attention to a disease that affects the brain, yeah. but the brain controls the rest of the body. I mean, it's. And needs to be it's paid attention important. to. kind of important. Yeah. I, I think it's almost essential. Yeah. Almost. Yeah. Yep. They like to, what is it they say? They like to treat the body from the neck down? Neck down. Yeah. yeah. Anyway, we have a long way to go, but this is really so enlightening. Yeah. So is there anything more you'd like to share with us um, before we wrap this up? And this has been wonderful and we could go on. I'm sure for another couple hours. Of course, of course. Yeah, I just, I think for anybody out there, all the stories, wherever you are, uh, there's no shame in this. Do not listen to the stigma from society. Just don't listen to it. Uh, It just leads to isolation and secrecy and dysfunction. Uh, You're not alone. And uh, siblings out there, I hear you. Contact me. I'm I'm ready to, to work with you and help you out. And all the links for today's show are in the show notes. That's awesome. Kim, we're so thankful to have you here today. And we and we have to stop. We have to wind down. And I'm going to close with this. I'm sure you felt like you were sitting at the wrong table many times. 
Um, not sure if you belong. Matter of fact, I know you felt like that because we've had many conversations about it. But you do belong. Your voice is so important. And keep working with your siblings and working with all of us to ensure that we're going to have some better outcomes down the way because what we're doing is so important. We need to start the conversations. We need to have the conversations. There is no shame. There is no, no, no blame. Um, We're going to get all get through this together by all of us raising our voices. Your experience um, spans over 30 years and counts immeasurably as as a sibling, an advocate for eating disorder treatment, and as an advocate for siblings with eating disorders specifically. How have you changed over the 30 years? And what do you what's what do you see going ahead? Uh, well, I definitely am. I have forgiven myself and my family and my sister, and I have deep compassion for our family. I look back at that time and I just um, I look at those that family and and just love them so much. It was so hard, and extend that to families today. Um, I've healed. I've recovered. It's, you know, something I do all the time. To I work on that all the time. Uh, and I've let go of shame. I've let go of blame. I've let all of that go. So in that piece, personally, that's been incredible. Do your work, people. <laughs> and the other part is, you know, I don't question any longer that we all need to be helped and to be supported. So for families out there going through this, I think the thing I've learned and the biggest change is educate yourself. Number one, get yourself supported because you think you can just trudge through. You cannot. It will break you at some point. So get yourself support in loving to yourselves. Be patient with yourselves. It sounds so woo woo. I know, but (laughs) it's critical. And, um, we are moving forward and we can make some change. It's just going to take all of us working together. And we are stronger together. We are absolutely stronger together. Absolutely. This has been absolutely wonderful, Kim. Thank you for all that you do and you do it all from the heart and with so much passion and the floodgates are going to open. I'm sure of that. And let me just tell you that you are at the right table. So thank you. And thank you for being brave enough to put yourself out there and advocating for siblings of all ages. It's making a huge difference. And I feel honored to know you. Oh, thank you so much. Well, it's been such a pleasure. Thank you all. Thank you, Kim. This has been wonderful. Thank you, Kim. So very, very much. Love you. Thank you, listeners. You're the best. Please help us get the word about out about Once Shattered Picking Up the Pieces because everyone's mental health matters. Tell your friends, share this podcast, rate and review it on the platform you're listening to. Thank you. And as always, we couldn't do this without Rockbox Recording and Production and that wonderful sound engineer and producer scott fitzgerald who expertly produces our podcast and does so much more this is the place this is the place to record your podcast record your audiobook and do a legacy cast for your loved ones thank you everyone for listening